So the board cover is back on now, and what I've done is just turned one circuit on at the moment, the downstairs sockets. I'm gonna go around and test all of the sockets on that circuit so that I know how many points there are and that the polarity is correct on every single socket. I don't just test the end of line on sockets, I test every single socket that I can access. Because it could be that there's a socket with reverse polarity on it, and we need to know about that. So that's what I'll do, just check this, write down the number of points and the highest reading for earth loop impedance that I find. Then I'll go on to the next circuit and the next circuit and just work my way through all the circuits. So using the Fluke 1664 FC, we have a no trip test, which we use on RCD protected circuits so that it, it does a low current earth loop impedance test that avoids tripping the RCD. And in this case, I've just got 0 0.37 ohms on this particular socket but it also tells me that the polarity is okay and it also gives me a PEFC reading prospective earth fault current reading which is quite handy um, sometimes and you can also get a ZI reading um, so that would be the resistance between the live and the neutral which is quite good to know and prospective short circuit current PSC as well. Um, and RE, which I guess is the R2 reading. So actually I've never noticed that one before. Let me know in the comments if you know what that's all about, but I think that's probably just the, the external, no, I think that's just the, um, what you call it? The R2 reading, probably. So I'll just show you the main water. Obviously, I checked under the sink. That's where they usually are. And the main stopcock is here. As you can see, it's got a little bit of copper, and it's got plastic, another little bit of copper, and then this is the main incoming poly pipe, which is uh, blue, blue polythene pipe uh, and then you know you've got a little bit of copper and then plastic joints and everything so clearly it doesn't need bonding so we can just put that as not applicable on the report we've got a little ant problem in here so I don't know where these little beggars came from but uh, they've got in somehow new tenants are not going to be happy okay so for these sockets uh, the downstairs socket circuits, I've got a total of 14 points. It's just one ring circuit that does the whole downstairs basically, so it's just the kitchen and that downstairs bedroom um, and a, a socket in the hallway. And then in terms of the earth loop impedance reading, I got 0 0.55 as the highest reading. So that's absolutely fine. So I'm not worried about that. The only thing that does worry me slightly is the fact that it's 2.5 mil on a ring but it's on a 40 amp breaker in the board. And I think that most of the walls have insulation. There's no chance that it's just clipped direct. I find that very hard to believe. So it's kind of borderline whether it can cope really. I'm gonna do some research on that one in the on-site guide and the Napit code breakers book and see what I come up with. So the next port of call is to test this. This is a water heater circuit, which basically does the central heating and hot water. Uh, so that spur there just goes down to here and I usually find it easier just to take the immersion heater cover off rather than testing at the spur because it's just a bit easier to get access usually. So I'm gonna test it here. Just gonna turn the switch fuse connection unit on and do the earth loop impedance test here. Zero point four. That's fine.
So next we have the first floor lighting to test. And uh, fortunately I can just about reach this without my ladder. So I just put my crocodile clip on the earth and then neutral and a oh, phase. Zero point eight seven. All good. So in terms of those lights, the first floor lights we had only four points up there basically, two lights in the hallway, one in each bedroom. So that's fine. Smoke detectors next, so that end of line is on the top floor, so we're going to test that. Right. So, this is the end of line for the smoke alarms, and we've got a nice accessible point here for the crocodile clip from the CPC. So we'll just clip that on there like that and then neutral and phase. And as always these probes are not the stupid thing about GS38 probes is that they're never long enough to access the live terminals. So I know I shouldn't do this what I'm doing now. It's not really the safest thing to do, but there's not really a choice unless you, well, yeah, there isn't a choice really. Um, 0 0.69, that's good. Yeah, let me know what you would do about these probes. I know that some uh, test leads, you can get these like long pointy thin probes to get into small terminals like that, but I don't think the Fluke do them. I, I think Mega do them, but I don't think Fluke actually do. So there's not really much you can do about that other than taking the little ends off, but then it makes them not GS38 compliant. So it's a bit stupid really, but they're just, you know, these three mil probes or whatever they are, they're never quite long enough to actually access the live uh, terminals. So it's a bit stupid really. So I'm just gonna put the cover back on on this now while I'm here. There we go. These things are the um, optical smoke alarms with just a normal nine volt battery backup. They are valid for 10 years still, but the battery doesn't last 10 years. The battery only lasts maybe a year or, or two. And it starts to bleep and have a red flash once a minute when the battery's low, which is really annoying. And then what people tend to do is just take the head off they can't stand it bleeping. So I always fit the 10 year lithium battery versions, which means that they're just good for 10 years and you don't need to worry about changing them or changing any batteries or anything like that. I find that a lot better. They are more expensive obviously, but you get what you pay for. And for landlords, it's, it's great because they're just in and they don't need to get anyone out to change the batteries or anything like that. So the next circuit is labeled security alarm and there's this fused connection unit here in the hallway, which I assume is the one. So I'm gonna just take this cover off and get a test reading on here. Now, a lot of electricians would see this and think, well, it's not in use. So I'm just gonna put not in use on the report. Um, which you can kind of understand why they might do that if they're trying to save time or something. But it's still a circuit. The cables are still buried in the walls. And at some point in the future, it could be put into use by an alarm company 
who will probably not do any testing on that particular circuit. They'll just connect their alarm in and presume that the wiring's safe. So in my mind, it's worth to just give it a test. It's like a five minute job. So why not just do it? Why not just do it? If you're gonna do it, do it properly at the end of the day. Okay, turn the breaker off, that might. Turn the breaker on, that might help. See, I was being safe there, having the breaker off while I removed the cover. Zero point three seven, perfect. See, how quick was that? It takes longer to actually take the cover off than it does to do the test. I've turned that back off, by the way. You know what's really annoying? is when you take a cover off and the screws were not actually threaded properly. And so when you try and screw it back, the screws end up cross threading. You know, the final tiny little bit of thread that was left on them gets knackered when you're trying to put it, screw it back in. And then you end up having to re-thread the back box, put new socket screws in, and it ends up taking forever just to take a stupid cover off and put it back on again. It happens more often than you might think. There we go. So that's circuit five done. Next is lighting second floor. So I'll flick that breaker on and we'll go for a little wander upstairs. Right, so I've got this one. Here's one I prepared earlier, as they say. I think the actual lamp is gone on this one because it's turned on at the switch, but it's not actually doing anything. Ah, I didn't turn the other RCD on, that's why. Stupid. Retake. Zero point nine seven. Oh, that's interesting. What's going on with that then? What? What's that? Dodgy lamp, looks like. These pendants are rubbish. I would never use Eaton accessories. So we've got to count the lighting points up here. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, plus the fan, six. Seven, eight, 
9, 10, 11, 12, plus a fan, 13. So we've got 13 points up here on this circuit. So while we're here, I've turned on the socket circuits for up here. Well, there's just one socket circuit. So I'll do a earth loop impedance test on this. 0.64. So the first floor and this second floor are both on the same circuit. So I've got to go around and just test all the sockets on these two floors now. Right, so all these sockets have been tested out now on the first floor and the second floor. 16 points in total and the highest reading was 0 0.65 ohms. So that's fine. So I'm done up upstairs here. Just got to put this cover back on. And then head downstairs. I've got the downstairs lights to test and the cooker and then I'm done. So in terms of furthest points, probably something like that down light is going to be pretty much there. Or the under, under unit lights, so I'll give those a go. Right, so I've got myself a junction box with one cable in, which is the end of line from the under unit lights. So it should be probably one of the longest circuits in the house as it's furthest from the consumer unit. So I'm going to test my ZD, uh, ZS here. Okay, so we've got 1.35, which is a fairly high reading, but acceptable. So if you are an apprentice or a learner out there, let me know in the comments what the reading maximum ZS reading for that circuit should be. It's on a B6, uh, six so it's a BS60898 BS6 MCB, type B, 6 amp circuit breaker. Let me know in the comments what the maximum ZS for that circuit would be. So in terms of number of points for this circuit, we've got one here. We do have one outside light as well, which I forgot to show you earlier. There. So that's two. We've got another one here, three, four. And we've got one in here, five, with a fan. Oh, I forgot to test the isolator earlier, so that's six. Then we've got six down lights in here, so that makes 12. And then we've got the under unit lights, which there aren't any there. There's one there and one there. So 13, 14 points on this lighting circuit. And there are no outside lights outside the back. So now last but not least, the cooker circuit. So I'm gonna just do an earth loop test on this one. Great when you've got a socket outlet on the cooker switch, that makes it so much easier to test. And we've got 0 0.44. And as there's just this one point on the cooker circuit, we just count that as just one point. There we go. So I'm just about finished here. Everything's tested. And I'm going to check the time on my Tradify app now and see how long it's actually taken me. So if I do stop timer, and it took me two hours and 10 minutes, which is quite impressive. You know, this morning when I said to you, I don't know if I'm going to get them both done in a day or not. Um, I never expected it to go this easy, to be honest. So quite pleased with how it's gone because we are pretty tight on the pricing on these um, EICRs for this letting agent we're cutting it fine shall we say when it comes to margins but if i do one in two hours ten i can head over it's it's 11 o'clock now so realistically i i got here at half past eight by the time i get out of here it's going to be half past 11 by the time i've packed up my tools and stuff so that's three hours of actual on-site time then it's going to take me another half an hour to get over to the other one that'll be 12 then i've got to shovel some lunch down and I'll start probably um, half past 12 on the other one. It's a one bedroom flat and it's empty. 
So we'll see how it goes. Maybe it'll be quicker than this one, or maybe it'll be a nightmare. Right guys, so I'm back here and I have just swapped out these circuit breakers, got rid of the 40 amps and I got matching ones 32 amps now for these ring circuits. So that's much better and sorted that out. Five minute job, easily done. And that solves that um, issue which could have been a C2. So we just uh, sorted it out and then we don't need to mention it on the report. So one last thing I forgot to mention but it's very important, is the labelling. So I've got me these labels and it's got to find a nice place to put them. They're a bit big actually, um, so, but I think I can just about squeeze it in there. And one of my pet hates is labels that are not straight. Yeah, that'll do. So I don't know if that's going to be straight, but anyway, there we go. Um, as you can see, I've put a five-year inspection retest on it. That's because it's a rental property and the new regulations that have come in now state that a rental property should have uh, an inspection every five years or on change of tenancy. So this one is now good for five years. Um, turn all the circuits back on as well. Yeah, this one's good for five years now and um, they can rest assured that their tenants are safe in a house which has fairly decent electrics. So as always guys, if you've enjoyed this video, if you wouldn't mind to hit a thumbs up, it helps the YouTube algorithm to tell us that you like our videos. And if you'd like more EICR videos, let me know in the comments. And of course, if you haven't subscribed yet, why haven't you subscribed? Join the artisan movement and hit the subscribe button and tap that notification bell so that you get notified every time I post a new video. And as always, thanks for watching. I really appreciate all the support that I have on this channel. I couldn't do it without you all. So thank you and have a great day.